Welcome to the Idea to Value podcast, where in every episode we highlight the latest insights into creativity and innovation from experts around the world. I'm your host, Nick Skillicorn. I care about the evidence behind what makes ideas happen, and I've already helped thousands of people just like you through my unique insights into recent scientific findings of how creativity works. I also show you how to turbocharge innovation programs so they finally deliver on the value and ideas you've been struggling to execute. Get your free training on how creativity can be improved by registering now at www.ideatovalue.com. Now let's get on with today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another expert interview on the Idea to Value podcast. I'm very happy to have Kostya Kimlat with me today. Kostya is a professional magician. He's known as the business magician, and he recently got a bit of fame on Penn and Teller's Fool Us TV show, where he managed to fool some of the most experienced people in magic. Today, we're going to be talking about the skills of magic, performance, um, originality, practice, and what it means for people to understand for innovation and creativity. Kostya, very happy to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me. So for people who don't know you, can you give us a bit of background as to who you are and how you got into your work? Absolutely. So I, I've been a professional magician for 20 years, and I started off doing magic for, for fun as a hobby, and very quickly as a teenager, it turned into uh, something that was bringing in income and uh, through college, and then eventually I just kind of saw it automatically t- turn into a full-time job. And I spent about 10 years traveling around the world teaching magicians about the techniques of magic and the psychology and the business. And at the same time, I developed my business out of Orlando, talking to businesses about the psychology of magic and how it relates to sales and communication, customer service. And and now most of my time is spent speaking to corporations about the role of perception in their business. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what magic means to you and uh, why you think it has this attractive nature of causing bewilderment in people? <laughs> you know, there's nothing as pure as that experience of astonishment. That's what we like to call it, the moment of astonishment, where you see magic and you experience it and nothing else in the world makes sense. And some people, their personality types, they get upset when you know nothing is making sense and others really embrace it. So I'm one of the ones that embraces the mystery. And, you know, when you watch magic, you know you're not watching a wizard, you know a, a warlock, you know your life is not in danger. So in this modern age, we're able to watch magic. And I think the importance of it is not that, oh, I was fooled by magic, but the fact that you can be fooled by magic reminds us of how easily our brains are deceived and how easily we believe in things. <clears throat> and to me, that's the, the important role of magic these days is to remind ourselves to, to pay attention. Um, and that doesn't mean you should try to figure out how a magic trick works. It just means that when you watch magic tricks and you're fooled, you go, wow, isn't that easy for my brain to be tricked? I wonder how else am I doing that in my life? So that's kind of the way magic has kind of turned for me to that direction. But in general, magic is my hobby, my love. It's what I love to do, and it's what I'll be doing for the rest of my life, bringing, bringing joy and excitement to people. That's what drives me. And what sort of magic is it that you do? Is it uh, one-on-one stuff? Is it more big stage illusions? <clears throat> Can you describe that for us? Yep. Yeah, so my specialty has been sleight of hand, close-up magic, and playing cards have always been my tool. But when I, I do events and where I'm performing, walking around, reading crowds, I'm using simple object coins, money, or bands, rings, so that I'm not carrying you know, weird props or boxes around with me. So that's the interactive close-up magic that we do at like cocktail events. And then for banquets and stage shows and theaters, I have what I call a theatrical mentalism show. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not trying to make my audience believe that I'm doing mind reading, so that's why I add the, the theatrical adjective to it. But certainly my goal is to make the audience watch the show and believe that, you know, wow, it sure looks like he's got these powers. This is what it would look like if it was real. So those are the two types of magic, close-up magic and, and mentalism on stage. And, um, you know, there's, there's a great saying, there's many rooms in the house of magic, and there's many types of magic. What I love about the Fool Us show is that people are starting to see lots of magic that they wouldn't otherwise see and a lot of magicians are getting their credit for the, the creativity and the weirdness that so many magicians have in their style. And I think that's probably a perfect <clears throat> segue into uh, talking about the, the TV show, which I saw and uh, which inspired me to get in touch with you. 
Um, for people yeah. who, who don't know much about magic, Penn and Teller are two of the most famous, well-established magicians in the world. They've, they've got their own Las, Re Las Vegas review show, uh, and they host this challenge called Fool Us to the World of Magicians, where they invite people to come on stage and try and show them a trick that these two professional uh, magicians can't explain. And you managed to do that, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. It was a wild ride. <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, what that really uh, inspired me uh, to, to get in touch with you for is this concept about originality, something that's so really ingrained in creativity, uh, but is mm -hmm. so difficult for a lot of performers to wrap their head around. And I think magic is this really interesting case study where it takes so long to practice and hone your craft, especially to be able to do it professionally. Uh, that uh, to then take it to the next level and to create your own tricks uh, is something that not all, not all magicians uh, manage to achieve. So can we talk about this concept of originality and magic and how it relates to creativity from your perspective? Yeah, yeah, I, I would I would love to because it, it is such a rich topic, and you know, with with juggling, juggler shows off his skills, right? You you see what's going on and you see when a ball is dropped. With the magician, we're hiding our skills. So with magic, most of the public doesn't know what's required to do to do magic, and they they also can't judge whether an, a trick is difficult or easy or original or non-original because the only thing the audience is seeing is the effect that's being performed. And so this is really one of those fields where you you only get to know whether someone is creative or not. If you're in the know, if you're, you know, if you go behind the scenes, otherwise, all you're, all you're looking at is is the performance. You know, if I've never seen a Shakespeare play and I see somebody perform, and I'm going to say, "Wow, that's the most original thing I've ever seen," <laughs> just because I don't know that it was written 500 years ago. Same thing for a lot of magic tricks. People will see it and they'll go, "Wow, that's original," not knowing it's been around for 100 years. Um, now, to answer your question, how does, you know, how do magicians innovate? How do they create? Well, like with any art. You have to know the rules before you break them, like Picasso said. So with, with the greatest magicians, the greatest innovators in magic, they're also the ones that have mastered the classics. And it's a bit like magic is like playing the piano, where once you learn how to play a couple pieces, you learn how to read notes, you can play almost any piece because you have that ability to do that. So with magic, once you pick up a certain amount of techniques and a foundation, it opens up a world of magic to you. And once you master a lot of the classics, then you begin to understand how other magicians have created magic, why they've taken the steps they have and made the choices they have. And then you can start to apply it to, to your ideas and make those choices. So it's interesting because I would say that what most people see as creativity and magic was actually creativity 50 or 100 years ago by one individual. And now it's been you know, mass marketed, so to speak. And now every magician is doing the same thing, but because people rarely experience magic to them, it seems original. Um, the interesting thing about magic is there's two sides, to, two sides to every magic trick, and there's two ways to create a magic trick. And this is what I talk to business people about. I talk to them about their methods and effects. So in magic, there's the methods, the reality, the systems of what we do, and then there's the effect that is perceived by the audience. And the effect that's perceived by the audience is purely imaginary because they're not seeing the methods that are being used to achieve that, right? So innovation in magic comes from two sides. Either there's innovation on the method side, which is perfecting a technique and maybe spending, you know, 100 hours working on some movement or, or slight that the audience is never going to see. And that innovation is only recognized amongst peers, and that was the innovation that I used to fool Penn and Teller. Whereas the other side is there's the effect innovation where you have somebody creative who doesn't care about how something is done, but instead says, hey, I want to make the Statue of Liberty disappear, right? Or, hey, let's make somebody teleport to the other side of the building. And, and that person is just creating the effect, the perception. And that's a really more beautiful creativity because... There's no limits to that. That's when you say, hey, let's just think of whatever we can come up with. What's the coolest thing we can do? And then we'll work backwards to figure out the method. So 
you know, when I do get a chance to talk to businesses about innovation, part of what we talk about is what's your approach? Are you trying to create the effect first or are you trying to create the methods first? And too many people in technical jobs get bogged down by methods. And what they need is a reminder to look at it from the customer's point of view and to think about what's the ideal effect I want to experience and start with that as the hub of innovation. I can't agree more because when I speak with clients about innovation, um, what they quite often forget is that it's all about what I call perceived value uh, from the customer's perspective. So the customer doesn't really care about what you think about your own ideas. They don't care about what's happening behind the scenes. They don't care if you think that a specific product is going to increase your profitability by uh, 12% or so. All they care about is the actual offering that you're presenting to them. And they're comparing that to everything else they already know. They compare it to what everyone else is offering them uh, from your competitor side or from startups that you might not be aware of yet. But it's all about their perspective. And I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Uh, this difference between the effect that people see uh, and the method that quite often the companies get obsessed with but the customer doesn't really care about. Yep. And, that, and that's the job of, of somebody who comes in from the outside who is not so in the weeds that like, oh, man, you know, when someone knows too much about their methods, that's all they see. And so you need a third party perspective to come in and say, hey, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Where are you trying to go? And so in magic, you know, sometimes you'll get you have all these methods, you have this toolbox to pick from. And I think that's actually not a great way to create magic, because then you're looking at all your tools and you're thinking, well, what can I build using a hammer and uh, you chisel and this, what do I have? Whereas instead, I think a much greater way to create is to come in and say, hey, what does my ideal house look like? What do I, where do I want to live? And then figuring out what tools you need to get there. And so I know that I get my most, my most creative magic has been effect-based, and it's often come from uh, feelings, right? So I'll go to an art show or a movie or a museum, I'll read a book and I'll get a feeling and what I then say to myself is, wow, I, how can I create the same emotion for my audience as this author or director just created for me? So the way I've been innovative is I use a different medium to create the same feelings of mystery and wonder or astonishment that I get from other art forms. And I find ways to use my tools as a magician to create those same feelings. I'm sure, though, now it, it all seems so simple and it, it, it seems like you can <laughs> create your, um, your, your tricks if you put in your imagination and your work. But uh, my understanding is uh, everyone has to start from zero. Everyone starts from a blank slate. And can you let us know a bit about how you developed the techniques and skills uh, and whether or not uh, the, original, the originality had to wait until a certain point once skills had been developed or if you'd always had that... Uh, aspect of it throughout your entire journey. Yeah, absolutely. I can, you know, I think back to when I got started in magic. Everyone gets started usually when they're either nine, you know, from nine to 15, their teenage years. Um, they want to be able to do something that their parents and their friends can't do. So they find magic and then suddenly they have this power. And so they practice these things. So I was that same age. I went to a magic convention and I saw an amazing magician named John Rockerbomber whom most lay people will, will never know or hear of, but in the magic world, he is um, a legend, and he does magic with playing cards. And he fooled me with a trick so bad that I was just, I mean, I saw like 100 tricks that weekend, but there was two tricks he showed me that blew my mind. And while he taught me the other tricks, he wouldn't tell me anything about those two, and the only thing he told me was the year that one of them was published. And so I had to spend the next year and a half tracking down a book that was published in 1967 that was a hard-to-find book, and it was the greatest gift he could have given me because in that search for that book, I had uncovered 20, 30 other books that opened up the world of magic to me. And, and in magic, the secret is the most important thing until you learn it. Once you learn the secret, you realize that a secret is usually maybe 5% of the success of the whole trick. But up until you learn it, it seems like it's 95. It seems like it's the most critical thing. So the creativity didn't come for me early um, on the method side because I, I didn't know anything about the method side. So I had to spend those years 
reading just dozens and dozens of books and everything I can find, just you know, downloading that data into my head. But but that was a time of VHS tapes and and books. And luckily, I did not have the internet because right now, the internet has all the secrets. But you don't know. It's like a shadow learning. You're not learning from the real source. It's like the blind teaching the blind. And unless you have a, a chaperone telling you what's good or bad, it's very easy to get overwhelmed by the internet. By focusing on the books, I was able to get the standard knowledge that you need in order to then proceed and create from that. It, it seems, so having said yeah. that, yeah, go ahead. It, it seems oh, like man. such a strange concept from someone who's an outsider to magic to think that you can learn all of these techniques, which are all about... Um, as we'd say in, in Germany, fin, uh, Fingerspitzengefühl, like the, the slight touch on your hands and learning these skills from books. <laughs> Is that really how magicians um, quite often learn how to do magic? It, it, it's, what happens is if, if you come to me and you say, hey, I want to learn a magic trick, I'm going to tell you to go to the library. I'm going to tell you to go to the books. If you come back to me and you say, hey, I read this and here's what I'm struggling with, you have now earned my respect and my time in order for me to show you how to do it right. And so you can learn how anything is done these days, but in order to gain the respect of somebody who's in magic and to have a teacher and a mentor, somebody help you, you have to show that you've put in the time. And, and that requires going to the source because the way the magic literature has been created is it is meant to be frustrating. As you read and learn magic, you are meant to be like, what is going on here? I can't figure it out because it's going to require you then putting it into the real world in order to learn what's working and what's not working. Um, but the greatest way to learn is still through a mentor and somebody who's going to help you in person. And the way to earn their respect is, is read the books. And I think that uh, follows on quite well to another thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is this concept of failure and things not quite working out. Because I can imagine uh, some companies are, are, are afraid of something that might go wrong in the future. But when you, when you perform a magic trick on stage and it doesn't go well, surely like it's extremely obvious that you picked the wrong card that someone else did or, <laughs> or the, object, the, the rabbit didn't disappear into the hat. It's, it's all there for people to see. So can we talk about um, when things go wrong for a second and both from an artistic perspective and from a, uh, uh, an overcoming obstacles perspective, what your views are on that? <clears throat> sure thing, absolutely. So, you know, when you're, the, the, first, the first lie, I guess, or maybe the first truth that I have to tell you is that most of the time when a magician messes up, the audience doesn't know that it happened. So... It's not that, oh, I picked the wrong card. It's not that obvious. Most of the time, when a mistake happens, it happens before it's revealed to the audience. And the magician halfway through the trick goes, oh, holy crap, this is, this is not going to work the way I wanted it to. <laughs> and so um, this happened to me at my very first um, audition. When I was like 12 years old, my friend started like a DJ group. And he had a you know, joking quote-unquote audition for like five of his friends to be this DJ company with him. And I remember doing this trick that I had practiced for weeks and I messed it up. But I realized the mistake five seconds before they did. And at this point, I'm, I'm stuck. There's a coin that's supposed to be inside the handkerchief, but the coin is behind the handkerchief. And, and it's supposed to come from the inside. That's the big revelation. And within five seconds, I realized, well, wait a minute. They don't know what's going on. I'm just going to pretend like I'm plucking it out from inside the handkerchief. I'm going to bluff this whole thing. And I bluffed it, and everyone was just as astonished. And at that moment, huge light bulb went up to me and said, wow, if you ever make a mistake, if you don't let the audience know you made it and you, you know, push your way through it, I bet you can get away with this again. And I can tell you probably five, six, seven times over the next decade that that happened in, in a much bigger way on stage. <laughs> and so the, the advantage that a magician has is when we make a mistake, if we don't let the audience know, then we can have a chance to, to be innovative and be creative and come up with new ways and techniques and methods. And it goes to that previous point where the audience doesn't see the method, they only see the effect. So as long as you keep the effect solid, they're, they're still amazed. I, so yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a big secret for you, you know. Um, 
But at the same time, when it does happen, when real failure occurs, it actually adds something interesting to the experience for the audience. Where the few times where I've admitted that, whoa, this is a genuine mistake, and okay, that, that happens, let's move on. I have had people come to me after the show and say that, oh my God, you know, you really must, that made it so much more believable and so much more emotionally and artistically interesting because they expect the magicians to always be right and a mistake made it more human and interesting to them. Uh, I, I think what that finally leads me on to is uh, really one of the most things that uh, the things that I find most interesting, which is um, whether or not you and uh, other magicians prefer to keep doing the same trick for new audiences, that it's kind of like playing the hits that you know are going to work. Or do you also have this innate drive to try out new things and be original and develop things that no one has seen before, not even people within the magic community? So that answer depends on the the magician's relationship with magic. If you're somebody who is um, a hobbyist and you you know you're in middle age and you just got into magic and something that you want to do, then there's you know you don't need to worry about creativity just yet. You want to learn about just you want to learn what's out there and you want to perform stuff and you're discovering magic and you're probably going to be. Um, learning simple magic tricks and buying a simple magic trick in a magic shop and doing it for your family and friends and they've never seen you do it so to them you're now a whole new person you're a new self and wow you're learning magic tricks you're different this is cool for somebody who's a, a full-time magician and doing it that's where what you said that's where the artistic and the, the soulful choice comes in do I want to always be doing something new because it drives my soul as an artist or am I okay with doing the same things 10,000 times. I'll, I'll tell you this. It may seem like doing the same thing 10,000 times is like just delivering a product and calling it in, and it can certainly become that way. What I've been lucky enough to discover is that I've been doing some of the same tricks, some three or four of my tricks. I've done them 5, 10, 15,000 times. And what I'm still excited about on, on the idea of why does this still drive me and why does it still inspire me is that when I'm performing it for people it's a different audience every time and my interest is no longer in the magic trick but it's in the people watching it and it's in their reaction and it's in studying their psychology and their personality so for me there are some tricks I've done 10,000 times and let's say I'm approaching a group I will do that trick during those 30 seconds I'm not looking at my hands I'm not worrying about my language I'm focused solely on the people then once I figure out who they are, then I can start doing something creative. Then, I, you know, in, in one of my pockets, whenever I'm doing a gig, there's always something new that makes me nervous. And I think that's the key to somebody who's been doing something for a long time. You shouldn't throw out the things you've done 10,000 times because your audience has never seen those, has not experienced those. You know, a comedian, if that's a new audience, you know, you're going to tell the same joke, the same opener, because you want to kill the, the room right away but then you find time to, to let your soul breathe, to let yourself develop as an artist, and you do something new, and you do something that scares you and forces you to take a chance. So after doing this 20 years, I think it's incredibly important to have a balance of both and not to overreach on one or the other. Don't just try to be completely original on everything that you do because you're going to miss the foundation, and don't just stick on the foundation because eventually you'll be bored. So that, that's my answer for you. I mean, it's, it's a great answer. And uh, just one last question on originality. As you've been talking and you said you go and you meet these groups of people and you're reading the room and you're reading their faces, once you get to a certain level of skill like you have, is there any ability to be spontaneous in trying out uh, or even creating a new trick uh, just specific for that moment that hasn't existed before? And for example, um, a couple of years ago, I was at a, uh, a cocktail event and there was a, uh, a gentleman doing magic going around and uh, it, he found out that I was German and he found that out sort of two minutes into a set and within two seconds, he said, well, you know what the Germans always say? And he flipped out four nines out of uh, just one after <laughs> the other in the deck. And he says, Germans are always just going nine, 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 nine. <laughs> <And> <laughs> yep. it, it just, it, it seemed like uh, um, 
it just was perfect for that moment. Is there any spontaneity when it comes to magic? Oh, yeah. So, so two great things. First of all, there's, we can talk about that in magic, and let's talk about that as a, an analogy for any business that wants to delight uh, their customers, right? Anyone from, from anything from Disney World to a Marriott to hotel chain. How, how do we make our customer service interactions seem spontaneous or allow those interactions to have the space for spontaneity so that the person checking the guest in not only follows the procedure, but then does something delightful just like that magician did for you, where the customer says, wow, that person paid attention to me. That's really what, what's at the core of it, is that when that magician did that for you, not only was it cool and he showed you that he was good, but it made you feel special because you were recognized. And you know, you, you're not going to get that in a movie. You're not going to get that in a play. But with magic, magicians have that ultimate ability to change the transaction as it's happening. And in that interactive, set, in, in an interactive moment, they're able to give you an experience that, that when you leave, you say, wow, that was created just for me in that moment. Now, here's the truth, right, with magic, is that when we perform, right, if I'm performing at a cocktail event, what I'm really doing is I'm doing 30 mini shows. And if I'm doing 30 mini shows in one evening, and I do that three evenings a week for 40 weeks of the year, for 20 years, you can imagine that adds up to a lot of experiences. Eventually, along the line, I will meet many people from Germany. So now when he did that for you, the next time he meets a person from Germany, he's going to create that same exact moment, and that person is going to say, my God, that was just for me, but it, it only happened because that person already had that experience, but the customer will perceive it as new, right? So I, without discounting it, I'm saying that I think that magician probably is talented enough that he's met a German person before, and seeing you clicked it for him, right? So he was able to deliver that experience for you. You're breaking my heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. With, with, well, with, you know, with magic, it's, there's a, uh, an amazing magician in Vegas named Mac King, and he's got the best afternoon show. And the reasons that magicians celebrate him is because he does the same exact show every afternoon, but there are several moments of perceived spontaneity where it looks like people have made a mistake and something's gone wrong and the audience member is freaking out. And it's only if you go back a second or a third time, and same thing with the Penn and Teller show, where you realize that those moments of spontaneity are so perfectly and beautifully scripted. And, and the reason they're in there is because that spontaneity is crucial to creating an experience for the customer where they say, ah, that's not just a play or a movie that was written without me. This was created for me. And we're in the experience economy right now, and that's what people need. They need those experiences. And so... It shouldn't be scary for a company to think we're going to let our people be spontaneous because guess what? That spontaneity <laughs> is going to be replicated multiple times until it gets perfected while still keeping the, the feeling of spontaneity, uh, hopefully. <laughs> so that's, that's the big answer for you on kind of on the business side of it. Kostya, it's been wonderful uh, speaking with you. I, I just uh, <laughs> am aware that uh, we, we don't have that much time left. Um, <laughs> related to uh, what we've been talking about now. About this stuff. I know. I'm obsessed with this stuff, <laughs> so I appreciate this. And I, and I hope this gets people interested. You know, if people are interested in magic, they can certainly learn magic tricks. But I, I think there's a lot more layers to magic, and it's connected to perception and communication and, and your topic of innovation. So I certainly hope that this gives people um, a teaser of, of what they can learn and, and what they can study by getting a glimpse of magic. And if they want to learn more about you and your work, uh, what, what sort of work is it and where can they go to find out more? Absolutely. So I, I talk to all kinds of organizations and businesses about the role of perception. So I talk to customer service and salespeople and executives about how they connect and communicate within their organization and to their customers. So companies can reach out to me on my website. It's kostjakimlat.com, K O S. T Y A K I M L A T dot com. Um, you can search up the business magician, find me on social media, um, and and connect. I'm I'm now spreading more and more of the content that I've been sharing with my clients for the last 15 years, and I'm now starting to really share that online. And so I love hearing from people and connecting to people from other businesses and seeing where where the ideas of magic and the practices of their business intersect and and making a positive difference. For organizations. So 
I look forward to hearing from you. Absolutely. Kostya, it's been wonderful having you and I look forward to speaking again with you soon. My pleasure. Today's episode was made possible by members of our premium deep creativity training program. For less than the price of half a candy bar per day, you too can get world exclusive daily exercises which push your creativity past its comfort barrier to make you better able to generate ideas in all aspects of your life and work. Invest in yourself now by going to www.ideatovalue.com slash deep creativity and using coupon code podcast for 25% off your first order. And don't forget that if you found this episode interesting, to like and share it, and to leave us a review in your favorite podcast player. See you again in the next episode.